Hello, my name is Rob Sparks, and I'd like to welcome you this afternoon, this edition of Live from NORLAB at Kit Peak. I'm your host, and I have our moderator today with us, Jamika Marshall, our guest today, Connie, Wa and Co Connie Walker. She's going to update us on the recent SATCON 1 conference and the impact of satellite constellations on astronomy. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can enter them in the chat box, and now we will relay them to Connie. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, first of all, this is live from NORLAB at Kitt Peak. So for those of you who might not be familiar with Kitt Peak, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about it. Kitt Peak was funded by the National Science Foundation and is a NORLAB facility. It was founded in 1958, is located about 55 miles southwest of Tucson, Arizona, on land leased for the Tona Otham Nation. We are indebted to them for letting us use one of their sacred mountains for astronomical research. Kitt Peak is home to over two dozen optical telescopes and two radio telescopes. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to give you a quick update on a recent science story from Kitt Peak. Astronomers using NSF's NORLAB facilities, including the Mayall Telescope at Kitt Peak, and a team of data sleuthing volunteers participating in Backyard Worlds Planet Nine, a citizen science project, discovered roughly 100 cool worlds near our sun, objects more massive than planets, but lighter than stars known as brown dwarfs. Several of these newly discovered worlds are among the coolest known, with a few approaching the temperature of Earth, cool enough to harbor water clouds in their atmospheres. To help find our sun's coldest and nearest neighbors, astronomers of the Backyard Worlds Project turned to a worldwide network of more than 100,000 citizen scientists. These volunteers diligently inspected trillions of pixels of telescope images to identify the subtle movements of brown dwarfs and planets. Despite the abilities of machine learning and supercomputers, sometimes there's no substitute for the human eye when it comes to scouring images for moving objects. For more information on this uh, discovery and learn how you can join Backyard Worlds and possibly help contribute to the discovery of more of these type of worlds, see the press release. Jamika is going to put the press release link in the chat so you can go there and see it. Now I'd like to introduce our guest for today. Connie Walker is an astronomer who works mostly on dark skies advocacy and education. Inspired from an early age by astronauts landing on the moon and the original Star Trek series, her curiosity for anything astronomy propelled her to be the first in her family to go to college and earn a PhD. Connie's been a scientist at Noir Lab for 20 years, creating, with the education team, innovative programs on dark skies education, as well as optics and astronomy programs through inquiry and research to excite teachers and students in STEM, and then sharing these programs via workshops, talks, and events all over the globe. She holds a bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy from Smith College, a master's degree in electrical engineering and computer engineering from the University of Arizona, uh, University of Massachusetts, excuse me, and a PhD in astronomy from the University of Arizona. A cool thing for her is that discovers a uh, Levy and Shoemaker named asteroid 29292 Connie Walker for her efforts in educational outreach. You can go up and look up asteroid 29292 and see it in the, if you have a good sized telescope. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Connie Walker. So to, to take it away, Connie. Well, thank you, Rob and Jamika, and it's wonderful to be with you all. Um, I cannot see you, so this is kind of an odd thing for me to, to talk and not see my audience. But anyway, uh, today I'm going to be talking with you uh, of, on a concern that has popped up in the last 15 months primarily. Uh, I have been involved personally with light pollution issues for mm, well over 15 years or more. But uh, this particular issue, which was about 15 months ago, that... Uh, kind of came to uh, to to a head um, it was is on satellite constellations and it's a new sort of source of light pollution concern for the field of, of optical and radio astronomy but today I'll just pr pretty much talk about the um, optical astronomy part of it um, so let me get to the next slide I wanted to show you this particular video which gives you a really good um, feeling or an overview of the concern we're going to be encountering in the next decade. Because what started off with just a few thousand satellites and a, and a few um, what they call satellite constellations or grouping of satellites became uh, 107,000 satellites that are probably going to be launched in the next uh, decade. And these 70% of these 107,000 come primarily from three different companies. There's Amazon Kuiper with their Kuiper project, um, and there's OneWeb and SpaceX. Uh, so most of them, as you will see, 
um, are at an altitude of about 550, 600 or so uh, for Amazon in particular and for SpaceX in particular. Uh, and they, they, they range in from a, a couple of thousand for Amazon to 10 times as many for SpaceX in the next uh, decade or so. OneWeb is going to be launching most of their satellites at this point to go up to an altitude of 1,200 kilometers above our surface of the planet. And, um, and that is problematic, as I'll get to a little later on in, in the presentation. Okay, so just as an overview, I, we have to start by saying that, honestly, astronomers in general acknowledge the merits of broadband internet services worldwide. After all, I wouldn't be here without those broadband services talking with you right now. Uh, those services are used... Um, quite frequently and quite uh, ardently with, within the field of astronomy for uh, various projects worldwide. So we are not in any argument over the, um, the uh, merits of these kinds of internet services. But what we're kind of concerned with are the repercussions it does to our science in terms of the number of the satellites, which I'll get into in a couple of slides, and the brightness in particular and what it does to the science in the, from the field of astronomy. So, so, and what we've been investigating lately with something I'll tell you about uh, called the SATCON 1 workshop or the Satellite Constellation 1 workshop, we're going to have more hopefully, uh, is that we, we think that partial mitigation is possible. It uh, may not be possible or feasible for all uh, science pro programs worldwide, but uh, for some it may be. Um, nothing is totally mitigation um, viable, but uh, there are roads to some solutions. And uh, hopefully working together with industry, which we have been doing in particular with SpaceX, there will be solutions. Uh, and things that uh, the brilliant engineers, especially at SpaceX, can probably help us discover, as well as the brilliant astronomers we have working on this pro problem or set of problems. So um, SpaceX uh, has already implemented something called DarkSat, which they painted various surfaces that were um, bright to begin with on the surfaces of, of one satellite. And they did, um, you know, many astronomers have actually observed that satellite to see how much darker it got. And I'll t talk about that in a few minutes. And then now they have uh, on every single satellite that they're launching as of late, they have visors or basically sunscreens to lessen the brightness on these satellites. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Now, as in terms of OneWeb and Amazon, we are very, very eager to talk more and more with them. We've just begun conversations. We haven't gotten very far just yet, but we're hoping that uh, with SpaceX's ex uh, exemplary um, efforts, that uh, Amazon and OneWeb, OneWeb might be um, con um, very happy to, to also get involved and see that we're not there to to run them out of business, which we never could do in the first place. But uh, to, we're, we're very, very happy to work with them actively on, on these, uh, on, these um, on solutions to, the, to the, what we find as astronomers to be problems. So, um, and of course, it has to probably be a, by a company by company sort of um, basis that we address these things because each company has a, basically different kinds of satellites that are up there. They're, they're made differently <clears throat> and have different parameters. So let me get to the next slide here. Um, so just looking to the future, because we, we know that in the future, we're going to have a tremendous amount of technology that is just, it's going to blow your mind, the kind of things that are going to be coming out in the next decade or two. Um, and and it'll, th each of these projects that are shown here, the giant Magellan telescope, the 30 meter telescope, the ELT, um, extremely large telescope, all of these in the future, and it may not just be the next 10 years, but it'll be maybe 20 years, uh, but they're going to substantially increase our understanding of the universe. But the, uh, this, these, this data has to have, it requires a dark night sky to uncover these secrets to some of the most fundamental questions about our universe. So I'm trying to advance. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so just to, to show you that uh, two uh, innocent astronomers were taking data one night in the middle of November on a telescope uh, called the Blanco 4-meter telescope in Chile. 
uh, on top of a mountain called Saratololo. And this is an NSF Aura Run uh, uh, facility. And they were using a camera called DeckCam, which looks at huge, you know, large patches of the night sky. Uh, I think about four and a half moons across, basically, and I'll show you that in the next slide. And they, um, <laughs> they were uh, surprised, let's just say, by some lines that, that uh, appeared across their image. And uh, you can see it here on this particular slide. Uh, they, uh, it's like almost, well, like claw markings or something. Uh, not quite crisscrosses, but uh, streaks across the, the images. And this image, again, is about four and a half times the apparent diameter of the moon. So it's a big swatch of sky uh, for astronomers. And uh, the galaxies they were looking at or trying to uh, observe were no longer detectable because these bright streaks overwhelmed the image. And now this is becoming more common an occurrence uh, for, for telescopes like these. So just imagine, now we just have maybe, I don't know, maybe uh, six, eight, six to 800 uh, Starlink satellites, let alone other, like the OneWeb has some up there right now. Um, th there's, there's, uh, there's other satellites that have already been in existence. Uh, so just imagine, though, when, when the numbers reach over 100,000, what that's going to do um, to the field of astronomy, basically. So the telescope that is the quintessential example of the kind of um, concerns we have with respect to the satellite constellations is the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is just uh, it's still under construction down on Cerro Pachon, another mountain in Chile, and is, is joining the family of our, our Noir Lab as well. Um, it has and will have, I should say, the deepest and widest images ever taken up at that point of the universe. It's going to be a 10-year continual movie, and you can see the changes that are happening in our universe, all the transient events. It will be about 37 billion stars and galaxies that will be detected in that time period, hopefully, and that uh, each night they're going to have about 20 terabytes of data that are taken. And at the root of all this is this wonderful camera, and you can see in the image just how huge that camera is. The person standing on the left of that image is about five and a half feet uh, tall, roughly. And this is going to be uh, starting, hopefully, in 2023. They, their point, their um, goals are to, to understand more of the history of our universe and discover rare exotic objects and the search for asteroids that may one day collide with the Earth, for instance. <laughs> Not to be dire about it, but <laughs> there you go. Uh, and to accomplish this, it's going to take a, a, very, a sensitive detector like you see here, a camera that's 3.2 gigapixels. You're talking billions and billions of pixels uh, covering three and a half degrees, and that's seven moon diameters. Uh, so that's a, a much bigger uh, swatch of sky. And, um, and again, it's, it's going to be impacted by multiple bright streaks if, we're not, uh, if we can't agree on mitigations that we can actually implement. So to start us off in that direction, we did have this satellite constellation workshop at the end of June and beginning of July. And it brought together both scientists in the fields of astronomy and, and uh, engineers uh, from industry and uh, also the field of astronomy and uh, to assess the impact of these satellites on optical astronomy. Now, like, we didn't want to be, you know, sensationalistic about this. We wanted to really consider, you know, where the science is going to be impacted, what telescopes are going to be impacted and uh, what instruments and perhaps some sort of solutions to all these things. Um, and we'll explore that in just a minute. Uh, and so the, the strategies, as I said, were explored and, uh, and a, 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 excuse me, a report produced with recommendations for observatories and for industry and for the federal agencies that hopefully in the future will fund us. So just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, this is part of an image that you saw uh, before, but it's a different image. But it's it's a part of a CCD uh, image, basically, and uh, it's from uh, the testing that went on is going on now with the camera for the Rubin Observatory, or has gone on uh, until COVID, basically. Um, and you can see that they they shown sort of a bright um, uh, had a bright source. They shown on the surface of the 
of the uh, camera, and it produced a bright streak, as you see here, which kind of replicates uh, what you might see from a satellite streaking across the sky. And the camera has the lens, you know, the exposure for maybe 30 seconds or so, and uh, it sees a streak instead of just a dot, which is what you would see with your eye. You would see a streak because you're leaving the camera eye open, basically. And so um, you not only get a streak, though, for something as sensitive as the camera that's going on the Rubin Observatory, but you also uh, get these residual, they call them residual artifacts or residual streaks, as you see here. And they think that if they can get the satellites, whatever satellite, whatever company launches out there, to be 10 times fainter than, say, the Starlink satellites were a few months ago, uh, then they could possibly remove or get software to remove these kind of residual streaks that you see here. Not necessarily the main streak, but at least the stuff on either side of it. So that's one step in the right direction that I wanted to give you. So what you're seeing here are the brightness aspects of things. That's one of the first issues, right? So the last slide and this slide deal with brightness. And the next two slides I'll show you will deal with a number, another aspect, which is the number of satellites. So in terms of the second slide on brightness, I wanted to show you this other diagram that shows you a bunch of dots, right? And the axis that goes up tells you how bright something is. So the brighter it is, it's going uh, on the upwards direction. And you see five dots there. And four of them are satellites, from Starlink satellites, that don't have any kind of dark darkening thing on them, or no, no visor, nothing. And then you see the fifth dot, which is a black one down near the bottom, which is the dark set where they did put uh, some sort of paint on there to cover um, the brightest areas of the satellite. And it did, it, it was successful in the sense that it was twice as faint, but we need to get down another almost factor of five, basically. So that was a step in the right direction, but it was not the final answer, basically. So kudos for SpaceX for doing that and taking the effort to try to mitigate. Uh, so they, when they saw that it was not going to be uh, the kind of numbers we, we needed for astronomy, they implemented VisorSat. And that, the first one was Starlink 1436. And that, um, that now, just as of last week or so, got to what they call final orbit at 550 kilometers. And um, a bunch of observatories are uh, on lockdown and cannot be used, such as observatories in Chile, unfortunately. But we are, I'm in the process with other people of getting uh, a bunch of other observatories involved in taking measurements. So hold on to that thought and check back with me in another month or so, and we can have some more numbers on how well VisorSat might be doing. Um, and then uh, in, to make these observations, you do not need these humongous telescopes like the Deccan 4-meter telescope, uh, but you can use you know, small, uh, even amateur uh, astronomy kind of telescopes, so 1-meter telescopes or, or smaller, 24-inch uh, telescopes, whatever you have, to make these, you know, because you need a wide field, basically, uh, to make these kind of uh, observations. So um, we're talking to a lot of those types of uh, observatories at the moment. Okay, so I'm going to show you next um, a, a, um, another video, and it is, uh, I'm going to do a little preface here, it is uh, done by a, a, uh, an astronomer called Daniel, Daniel Kolchowski, who was part of our SATCON 1 group, and hopefully will be part of our uh, effort we're doing now on another workshop. Um, but he did a, a, a simulation of 20,000 passes of 10,000 existing satellites that are traversing the sky as we speak. But this is basic for, it was for August 16th of this year uh, that the simulation was done. And it was over the skies that would be for the Rubin Observatory where it's being built. So, uh, as, and you will see that, that, that uh, there's, I'm not gonna show the whole video because it takes a few minutes, but I'm just gonna show the first minute. And that shows basically the first three hours of the night where it's twilight, and that's the time where the sun is still hitting these satellites, so you're going to see them. Uh, and the last three hours of the night where it's becoming, you know, morning, as sun sunrise is coming, uh, that's when you're going to see them again. So uh, you might have in, in the summer nights, like in August, you might have four hours in the night where you're not going to see very many for uh, satellites that are at low altitude, but for the ones that are at 1,200 kilometers, you'll see them 
all night. See a few of them all night. I'll show you something else on that. So let me just give you an overview of what this is like. I'm going to have to try to go to the next slide and get this going here. There you go. So you can see them moving <laughs> across the sky, uh, quite a bit of them in the first uh, three hours of the evening. And it's going to stop here shortly. And it sort of dies off uh, toward the middle of the night. That's going a little bit longer, so let me just stop it here and go to the next slide. Um, and this gives you another representation. And let me, let me explain about this particular diagram. So there, there's a blue curve, and there's a sort of an orange colored curve. And this blue curve is for satellites that are at 1,000 kilometers, sort of like the OneWeb satellites that are, that are um, being launched and going to be launched. And then here you have the ones that are like Starlink and probably the Amazon Kuiper when, once they're launched. And uh, this is a typical night at Saratololo or the Rubin Observatory. They're located at 30 degrees south latitude. Uh, that's where this is supposed to be a summer night. And it goes through the whole night on the uh, axis going across the page, where you have sunset down on your lower left occurring at this point. This red line is when the sun is low enough where it's considered a dark part of the night. And then the line up here, the other red line is when you you go towards sunset, so the sun is getting higher and higher and higher. Uh, and sorry, <laughs> I don't know what happened there, but let me go back to the slide. I have to be careful not to put my cursor over the slide. So as you can see, uh, there are at least even in the middle of the night where you get less and less satellites, you're still looking at 40 that are brightly lit any one time across your sky in the middle of the night from satellites that are at uh, 1,000 kilometers or higher. So that's one of the points of this particular uh, this particular slide. Okay, let me see if we can go next. So I want to show you this beautiful image of the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, it ha it's a subject of lots and lots of research, especially at our observatory. Uh, and this, um, if you look at an optimal observing time in the south summertime, for instance, um, you have, if you have, as I said before, one web satellites, which will be about almost 48,000 in the next 10 years at that high uh, altitude of 1,200 kilometers. Uh, people like Pat Seitzer, who was an expert at, at, model, at simulating these kinds of uh, circumstances, he says that every 30 seconds, every 30 second exposure, I should say, will have at least one satellite trail in the image. So that's something to be concerned with. And actually, this beautiful image was taken by someone that's at the European Space uh, Agency. OK, so uh, now I'm getting to the recommendations for you. And I'll, I'll try to um, not go too fast through this, but um, give you just enough sense of, of the kind of recommendations that were uh, be, being uh, uh, given by the, the satellite constellation uh, working groups. Um, so of course, you want to we do want to lower the orbit so that it's about 550 and not 1200 because if you are at 1200 the satellites go slower across the sky because they're further away and also they are um, they are sunlit more of the time of night and that's why you see more of them and so if you have them at a lower orbit um, it's a much better chance of not uh, having us you know the whole night <laughs> seeing these satellites being visible so uh, and then using, if they can, and this is this is something where it's very difficult to um, to make sure this this recommendation recommendation gets done because satellite companies have invested a lot of money and time in, in designing their satellites. But we would recommend strongly that uh, less reflective materials obviously are used on the satellites. Uh, they do have their reasons for doing what the cho choosing the materials they have, but. Um, uh, we would really like to see less reflective materials. Um, and of course, uh, darkening the satellites with either paint or sun shields, as we talked a little bit about in the, in the instance of Visorsat especially, uh, which might be the solution we're looking for. We'll be finding out shortly. Uh, and, and then something I have not talked about yet, but you can actually adjust the satellite so that it is, it's oriented in a particular direction towards the, the Earth.
so that that particular direction does not have a lot of surface area. And uh, I wish I could show you right now because I did have a model here. I don't know if I'm, I'm on screen at all. <laughs> but I can show this in front of, here's an Earth. I don't know if you're seeing this. And I've made this a, a, a Starlink satellite. And if you orient it so that um, the razor edge is facing the Earth instead of the um, more surface area of like the uh, solar array or solar panels, then you will get uh, less chance of light being reflected, especially towards the observatories. So um, anyway, so um, and then we have, uh, of course, we'd love them to have fewer satellites, only try to launch the number that they absolutely need in order to have internet service. Um, and another question that we um, did not get too much into in our SATCON 1, but might be the purview of later uh, SATCON um, workshops is deorbiting. Uh, there's huge uh, worries about um, collisions and, and deorbiting and uh, and in this case um, some of them that are the higher levels like the 1200 kilometers for one web can take more than 25 years to deorbit. I mean it could take a century uh, and that's just not uh, a good thing for a lot of reasons. Uh, but the ones that are at 550 I think their maximum <laughs> might be 25 years and there are companies like SpaceX that want to do it immediately or within five years but um, there are there for reasons that I, I don't want to get into right now there are um, pushback by other agencies on that believe it or not so um, supplying the location and the timing of these satellites so if the companies could let us know uh, more precisely we I mean there are um, sources where you can get that information, but they're not always uh, precisely accurate. And the companies don't really even know until a few hours ahead of time precisely where a satellite <clears throat> might be and the timing of it. But if we can kind of coordinate on these things, it'll be a lot better for the observatories because perhaps we could do some avoidance and create avoidance software. Um, but that also might have to be a joint effort between observatories and companies. Um, that won't always work for all observatories. Um, and another thing is if you, if you uh, have shutters that can close quickly, you might be able to avoid uh, satellites passing by. But then again, that's not always a possibility for all observatories either. Um, and then <laughs> finally, <laughs> the streak removal that I, I mentioned earlier uh, from images is hopefully going to be more explored more. But again, it's not only a resource problem in terms of people being able to um, create this type of software, or, and not only a funding issue for, to pay these people, but it's just um, the, the setup of the individual observatories. It just might not be uh, feasible on a physical um, basis. So um, let me see if I can. I have lost my cursor, so hold on. OK, next slide. Um, so just the bottom line. Uh, the bottom line basically being that there's n at this point, but hopefully in the future there will be, but at this point there's no combination of mitigations um, able to completely avoid uh, the impacts of low Earth orbiting satellites, otherwise known as LEO satellites, uh, on the science programs of the upcoming generation of optical uh, astronomy facilities. Um, so to some degree, some less and some more, uh, um, most observatories will be affected in some capacity. And we're hoping that the companies can meet astronomers, uh, partway at least, <clears throat> in helping out to mitigate uh, the, the problems. Uh, that remains to be seen. SpaceX is a, is a supreme example on all this, and we really thank them once again. Um, but even if satellite companies launch tens of thousands, and you know, at, at uh, if, if you consider the ones that are at 1,200 kilometers, as we said in a couple slides ago, every 30 second exposure taken, um, <clears throat> like in the, at the summertime example that I gave in the southern hemisphere, where we have these, you know. It's the mecca of, of, of astronomy observatories in the Southern Hemisphere in Chile. Uh, every every 30-second exposure will have at least one streak in it, unfortunately. Um, so um, um, it's going to be a challenge. <laughs> and, and I really hope that uh, we can all work together, not, not to make this entirely sensationalistic. It's, we cannot do that because that won't get us anywhere. That'll just have us spin our wheels, and uh, we have to work together astronomers and industry and trying to make this um, a viable, you know, try to find viable solutions to all of this, which I think we can. 
It'll, it will not be completely the way astronomers want it, uh, unfortunately, but it will be, uh, I think, a good way to, uh, well, at least to compromise, if not uh, to being able to do the si kind of science we want to do in the future. So uh, anyways, uh, I love this quote. It was from one of our working group members. Uh, the, the night sky is a natural resource, and like the air and the water, it should be preserved for all, the benefit of all. And that doesn't just include astronomers. It includes indigenous groups that celebrate the night sky, you know, celebrate the night sky. It includes amateur astronomers uh, enjoying the night sky. It includes astrophotographers. It includes the general public. Uh, it includes any effect it might have on animals. I don't know anything about that, but, you know, who knows? Uh, so it's not just astronomers, and uh, I'll leave you there with with that. Um, and there's some links to uh, the SACCON reports and the press <laughs> briefing video. Um, it was very good press briefing that we just had on uh, about a week ago now. It was actually on Tuesday last week uh, um, with the general public and with the press. And uh, then I have the two videos that I showed you down here as well linked. So if you might want to take a picture of that and look at it later, you have all that information. Um, and I'm sure actually this will be posted so that you can you can get that information later as well. Um, uh, Jamika and Rob, may I may I continue or do you want me to stop here? You can go on. Okay, all right. Because here is a really uh, um, great challenge I want to offer. Uh, especially to the Noir Lab locations in Hawaii, in Chile, and in the Tucson area. And I'd also like to extend the offer to countries around the world uh, to please get involved in our September's challenge for a project called Globe at Night. And um, I did actually speak to this project called Globe at Night in the last, well, two or three months. I had two... Um, live at Noir Lab uh, events on this topic. And we thought, ooh, this is great opportunity to try to get you all involved, both in the Northern and some Southern Hemispheres. So in the Northern Hemisphere, for instance, we have this fantastic constellation of Cygnus, which I'll show you in a moment, is quite easily uh, seen. And then you have Sagittarius, which basically looks like a teapot. And I'll show you that in a minute, too. Um, so let me go to the next slide. So. It is a very opportune moment this particular month because September is when we have the autumnal equinox. We have equal day and equal night for most part, all parts of the world, basically. So we have a level playing field, basically, for everybody who wants to be involved with Globe at Night. You have the same number of hours per night. You don't have to wait until 10 o'clock to make an observation necessarily. You can do it earlier. Uh, but you do want to wait till about an hour after sunset when the sky is darker. And you do want to get your eyes adjusted. So you might want to sit out there for 10, 15, for some of us, 20 minutes who are a little bit older and don't have as much dark adaptation for their eyes. But um, anyway, it's a very easy citizen science program. And you can see the website there is just globeatnight.org. And we have run this program for 14 years. Everybody is, can be involved from all over the world. We pick 10 days each month, and those days change because the moon has, you know, changes its phases at different times during the month. And, um, and so the 10 days that we have is when the moon is not up as a natural light bulb in the night sky uh, for the first half of the night. And uh, so that's when we ask for you to please take your measurements and, um, and please get involved. So let me just give you a tiny bit of what you're in for. <laughs> Um, we have, for the Northern Hemisphere, seven charts of Cygnus, and I don't, it didn't replicate too well on screen here, but you will see, for instance, I'm going to get my cursor over here. Hopefully you can see my cursor. You have, this is Cygnus right here. It looks like a cross in the night sky, and it's actually a swan with the beak at the, op at the middle of this triangle that you see here, and Deneb is the brightest star in that uh, group of stars called Cygnus, or the constellation of Cygnus. And um, Deneb is one of three bright stars in the night sky. If you go out after 8 o'clock at night, say, for example, this time of year, and you look up, you're going to see a triangle. Uh, this is the triangle, Deneb, Altair, and Vega. And, and uh, whoop, well, anyways, um, go back one. And this is what uh, um, you're going to be using, this area, to gauge how much light pollution is in your night sky. 
And if you have something like uh, what you would see in New York City or uh, uh, we'll see in, late, later in Santiago, you're going to see only a few stars. This is for, say, the Northern Hemisphere in New York City. Uh, and, but then as you get uh, further away from city lights uh, or you have a city that's not as light polluted as um, New York City, you're going to see more stars eventually. So you get from chart one, chart two, chart three, and then on the next slide here, sorry, you're going to see it gets even better. And so by the time you reach chart seven, you're out in the national parks where you can't tell one constellation from another anymore. But there you still see the three stars and you're looking in the middle here towards uh, uh, as many, uh, the faintest star you could possibly pick and match it to one of our seven charts. So you, this is a matching game, basically. You're not counting stars. So for the Southern Hemisphere, you, <laughs> you have um, right here, it's, it's very faint on this diagram, but you're going to see a little teapot on its side. And you have Jupiter right close to it and Saturn not too far away. Again, you see Altair, as you saw before, uh, Antares and Alpha Centauri. So those are your markings for the, where the satellite is going to be sort of central to those objects. And if you start with chart one and go to chart seven, say, so chart one will be like Santiago, perhaps, where you just see a couple stars and you see the bright planets, Jupiter and Saturn. And you could keep going and you're going to pick again. Uh, and as you keep going, if you, if you keep looking at the charts, comparing to your night sky, whichever chart you, you, you leave your, um, and we'll show you in a minute, uh, your, uh, the, whatever chart you leave up is going to be the chart that is the one you choose. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me show you one more one more thing first. Uh, okay, I, I should have um, put this a little bit different order, but anyway, uh, we have here um, currently uh, the reason why I'm, I'm picking on our three different uh, Noir Lab locations is because we really should be leading the pack on the number of observations <laughs> that are uh, going towards a little bit night. But we have um, less than 50 mostly and for all our locations, and I'd like to kind of have us do a little bit better. So this gives you an indication of what the maps look like. And here you see Tucson with its 50 observations or so. The brighter the dot, like in the center of Tucson, the brighter the sky, the darker the dot as you go further and further away. You'll see very dark dots. There's actually some beyond the scope of this picture here. But um, the darker the dot, the darker the sky. And that's the calibration here that you see with the charts. So there'll be chart one, chart two, chart three, chart four, chart five, chart six, chart seven. So, um, and that'll, that'll have, is directly mapped from one to the other. And, and uh, this is, <laughs> this is our, our inspiration. Okay, so I was looking online not so long ago at the, who's leading in the number of, of observations around the world. Australia was first because they actually got 6,700 observations in one night believe it or not, because they did a campaign for the longest night of the year for them, June 21st. The, the second country is USA. The third country right now is, uh, I want to show you here, is this tiny little island of uh, La Palma. It's among the Canary Islands, which are associated with Spain. I thought these, uh, these observations were coming from Spain, so I was looking at the continental Spain you know, the continent uh, where Spain is, and I didn't see anything. I was saying, hmm, hmm. So then I, I saw this pop up, 33, over 3,300 guys, 3,300 from this little island. So if this little island, which is 1 15th the size of the big island of Hawaii, if they can do it, we can do it. And how do you do it? You have these measurements here, which are just six easy steps. Uh, and the first one, it gets asked you when you made your observations, so time and date, and the second one, where you made your observations. And if you have a smartphone, these two uh, sets of numbers go in automatically on your smart device, whether it is a tablet or a, 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 a cell phone or whatever. Uh, it'll go in there automatically. And so the third one is how dark your night sky is, and this is where you uh, look at the seven different charts You'll see the little thumbnails down the bottom of the screen here on the left. And the one you click shows up on the bigger screen. And if you can match what you see with what's in these charts as in terms of the faintest star you see, then that, and you leave it there, that's the one you want. That's your measurement. It's as easy as that. And then you just pick what kind of uh, sky conditions you have by picking, clicking on which picture resembles most of uh, your, your sky conditions, whether it's clear or extremely cloudy. But we hope if it's extremely cloudy that you're not taking measurements because there's no measurements really. 
Um, but if you want, hey, whatever. <laughs> um, and then uh, number five, if you have something called a sky quality meter, uh, you can insert the measurement here, but it's not necessary if you do not have one. And I have one on hand. If we uh, step out of this, I can show you. Step out of the uh, presentation. And then the sixth step is just clicking on send data. And that's it. It's so, 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 so easy. Um, so I'm here to answer questions about the satellite constellation stuff and to answer any questions you might have on September's Globe at Night Challenge. Um, for um, any, any, any question you might have on them. And again, I hope you'll participate. It is a lot of fun. It takes about 10, 15 minutes to get dark adapted, but 30 seconds to take your measurement. Feel free to take more than one. Feel free to take them at different locations. Um, and feel free to ask questions. Thank you very much. Um, okay, over to you guys, Jamika and Rob. Am I offline? Hello? Oh, you're, you're, we hear you loud and clear, <laughs> Connie. So thank you so much again. Uh, we're here, I'm here from the YouTube Live uh, chat here. Again, my name is uh, Jamika and I'm a outreach assistant here at the International Gemini Observatory, a program of NSF's NORLAB. And yes, we are very excited about uh, September's Globe at Night Challenge. Um, first, we uh, you mentioned just a moment ago about uh, observing conditions and that uh, to begin with, you may want to have about 30 minutes uh, to acclimatize, to let your eyes um, acclimate to the night sky. Can you talk about that just a little bit for those in our audience who may want to participate but aren't quite sure why that step is important? Um, yeah, you don't need 30 minutes typically, but you might need 15 minutes or so. Yeah, um, you're, you know, when you when you go outside and you look at your night sky, your your eyes are not adjusted to the darkness just yet. And, and so what you're gonna, if you take a measurement right after you go outside, it's not gonna be a, an accurate or, or um, very um, reliable measurement, right? You're gonna not see as many stars as you would as if your eyes got adjusted to the dark. And it has to do with the, um, uh, I mean, I actually, Rob can talk a lot about this. He's good at talking about this kind of aspects, but it, it has to do with the uh, rhodopsin in your eye, in, your, in the cones in your eyes and, and uh, it getting uh, kind of, a, Reacclimated to the to the, the, your environment, which is now a darker environment, so that your eyes can actually, um, so you can see the, the stars better, basically. So um, you'll have more stars that are visible if you wait 15 minutes, and you can take a more accurate measurement at that point. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does, uh, mm -hmm. Connie. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to add? I know you're uh, definitely, as Connie said, have a lot of experience with this. Um, why is it important to uh, have that time to let our eyes adjust? And then, as we're, as Connie is talking about, as we get ready for these, um, to take these observations for this challenge, um, what? Uh, might you suggest the lighting around uh, outside where people would be taking those observations? Should those be dim lights? Should they be red lights? No light? What what should they have, Rob? Well, you, you pretty much just set me up for the perfect segue there, Jamika. Thank you. Because the rhodopsin that builds up on your eyes, it's a slow process, as Connie said, takes you know, 10, 15 minutes for it to build up to a maximum level, which helps you detect the dim light very well. However, rhodopsin is also extremely sensitive. It's not, the chemical bonds are not very strong, so they can be broken by normal white light. So if you look at a bright white light, the rhodopsin just goes, the bonds get broken, it gets destroyed very quickly, and you have to wait another 10, 15 minutes for it to build back up. Uh, red light, however, has a low, much lower energy than the blue light. So if you have a very a nice dim red light, that will uh, not interfere with the rhodopsin production in your eyes as much and will let it build up. So you want to di dim, dim red, ideally no light, obviously, but if you have to have some light around you for safety purposes, red light is by far your best option. Great answer. So Connie, yes, thank you, Rob. Um, Connie, so um, I know this, uh, this, this challenge, which yes, we're all taking seriously. And I definitely personally will say right now that I will be um, participating in, um, I would like to say that uh, this is approachable for anyone, correct? 
uh, any age, basically, uh, with uh, parental support or guardian support, we could have um, children starting at what age participate in this? Well, I would, I've seen um, children as young as eight years old participate, and I think it could go younger too, with the proper, as you said, par parental guidance. It's very, very easy. Um, it, you know, a process that just takes a few seconds, and you can do it from your backyard. This is what makes it so nice. Um, unless you, you know, live in a hotel room without really the ability to look outside very well, or I mean, a, a apartment complex. Uh, um, for instance, Beijing. I, I, I noted that when I was <laughs> there in Beijing. Uh, but if you're in, a, in a, ba a situation with a home that you can go outside to your backyard, and you're, you know, you're, you're under COVID-19 situations too. So this is a primary COVID-19 activity. It's a great activity to do. Uh, very easily with your kids and and help the science that goes behind this uh, help uh, the citizen scientists uh, you know can help the scientists around the world uh, uh, take this data and actually do something with it as we have in the past thank you Connie yes we look forward to everyone's uh, participation and of course we uh, are uh, very much interested in your questions and comments. So here you can see that you can follow us here at NORLAB Astro. Also there you can uh, have leave your questions and comments for on today's presentation and as well as uh, questions and comments about participating in this challenge that Connie has put out for us, the Globe at Night. Okay, so we have um, a question here from the YouTube chat going back to the uh, SATCON 1 workshop. Um, we have, uh, I believe this is Leanne. Leanne says, thanks for the presentation. Is the video of the satellite tracks at the beginning of the presentation available? And I wanna say, I think you have those links. Yes, Sorry. I do. I, I put them, let me see if I can get back to, I'm trying to guess uh, if I can get up there. Okay, good. Yeah, so it, do you see the screen still? Yes, okay. we can see the screen. Oh, oh that's perfect. Yeah. So the first, sub, so the first uh, video that you saw was of the 107,000 planned satellite, uh, satellites video. And it's from uh, analytical graphics, something really, AGI they call it. And uh, if, you, if you just uh, put in, you know, if you can't seem to see all this uh, address here, you can actually just put in your browser 107,000 planned satellites video, and you'll you will actually get this. It's on the YouTube um, uh, channel. Thank you so much, Connie. Um, yeah. So, Leanne, yes, we uh, Connie has these links here and um, I will be sure to put them below the video description so that they are accessible to you and to anyone else who may be interested. Um, and so uh, and since we're back to the SATCON one, we had um, one other uh, comment earlier. Uh, first, Leanne says, thank you, Connie. <laughs> she says, thank you very much for that. And uh, one comment earlier on was um, who, participated in the, the SATCON one. We know it was uh, astronomers and engineers, but were they all professionals or were there um, any one who kind of was the voice of those regular amateurs outside who may be using their telescopes who also could be impacted by these satellites? Uh, yeah, most people were professional astronomers, but we did have a couple of amateur astronomers on the, on the um, uh, on our satellite constellation, uh, sorry, our working groups. And uh, we had people, for instance, from the International Dark Sky Association, who, who he is a professional astronomer. However, he has the interest of amateur astronomers and the advocates from the International Dark Sky Association and the chapter uh, members. All, all uh, um, uh, he, he kept us really honest about that, let's just say, and uh, was very good about uh, keeping that in the fold uh, in, in whatever we did. So, yes. And you'll see primarily, if you look at the um, links that are still on this page, uh, the appendices in particular have the main reports from the four different working groups that we had. Uh, they had working groups on just basically observations, simulations, uh, mitigation strategies, basically, and then recommendations. And in the, in the recommendations section, primarily, uh, it, it had um, our... Um, we addressed uh, the citizen science, amateur astronomers, and even... Um, 
there's concern that we probably will talk about in our future SATCOM meetings of how it impacts like indigenous populations if it does, for instance. So the, and, and the bioenvironment. I mean, there's different things you can consider in all of this. So, uh, but but we were you, she, the, whoever asked the question. Thank you. Um, we we did primarily focus on uh, uh, astronomers and the industry uh, mostly. Thank you for that, Connie. So yeah. for uh, anyone else in the YouTube audience, if you have other questions, please let us know. Um, and I will come back in the last few minutes um, to share those questions and comments, additional questions and comments uh, with our science guest, Constance Walker. Uh, over to you, Rob. Okay, if, uh, I was gonna ask if, Con I was gonna just say, what Connie, would you like to, should I show them the, um, uh, the uh, live view of the Starlink satellites from heavens above? Because that's something everyone can access that I think might be of great interest to this audience. Yes, and we can also get into what amateur astronomers and, and the general public could be able to do too in terms of uh, observing. So yes, would you do that? I'll stop sharing this then. Yeah, stop, stop sharing, then I will start sharing and I will pull that up because I've already gone to that website. So let me make sure I get the right, uh, there it is. Okay, so we should be going to my website right here. This is heavensabove.com. And on the fr front page of Heavens Above, they have a, we have let you do a live view of the Starlink satellites. So this is live of where all the Starlink satellites are at this particular moment in time. And if I scroll up to the top of the page, you can see there's a timer here, it's 1.53 p.m. It says 13.53 p.m. That's Tucson time, of course. And if I want to, I can you know, set, set the time forward and set the time a little faster and let's see how the stars move over time so I can see where they are later today or early evening and that sort of thing. So, and this is just the first 10 launches. There's six, 600 and some satellites up there right now. So as Connie said, Imagine this gets up to be the 100,000 satellites and you're just seeing what's actually up there at this time. You can also go up there and see if you, this is from all launches. You can also just go up there and see, if you wanna see what's the most recent launch where the Starlink 11 satellites are that were just launched a couple of weeks ago, you can do that. And hey, they're not on the side of the earth right now. So, <laughs> but you can actually see, what, see them by individual launches as well. And the next scheduled launch is actually tomorrow morning. So the next scheduled launch is tomorrow. And I expect they'll be added fairly shortly after a, this, co this comes in as well. So, And you can tell the younger ones from the older ones because they're all like a string of pearls, as you see there. There's at least three. Yes, see. right here. Right mm -hmm. here. You can see this. These are probably more recent launches. I haven't spread out quite as far yet. Where So you'll definitely see some of the more recent ones. I expect tomorrow night, if the launch goes off as scheduled tomorrow morning, we'll see a new, a new nice string like the new nice tightly packed string like that. Mm -hmm. And they would be noticeable uh, probably in your night sky. And that brings me to another, um, let me see if I can remember the name of it. NASA uh, has, because um, Sten Oldenwald uh, is the creator of a um, citizen science uh, program called um, uh, hmm, Streak Watchers, I believe is the name of it. Do you, can you put that up on, online? Uh, that might be something that a general public could also get involved with. Streak Watchers? Streak, yeah, Watchers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they, I don't know their website. I've heard of them. Uh, you might need an R instead of steak. <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, steak watchers. That's 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 pretty good, huh? <laughs> and I love what comes up for steak watchers. Yeah, it's a new Weight Watchers program. <laughs> Sorry. <Yes. laughs> I think it's a NASA program, so I'll say Streak Watchers NASA. Satellite Streak Watcher. There, yes, there's yeah. a there on it. Yeah, you there's can either do the size starter or the anecdota data, whatever it is. Here's yeah. here's the uh, yeah here's the. Mm -hmm actual Streak Watcher website. So it looks like they have a mobile app even. Yes. And so you too can get involved uh, by uh, providing your um, impressions of the number that you see at the time you see. So, And you can also get that information to know when to observe from heavens above, like uh, I think um, you know Rob was alluding to there. Mm -hmm. So you know when to go outside, when to observe, when to get your uh, app out for satellite Streak Watchers and um, and take your data for the common good of science. Do you have any last minute comments or questions from the chat room, Jamika? Um, no final questions. Uh, the last one was um, was a, a thank you for from Leanne for uh, Connie's um, response. 
Um, but yeah, I've just been putting those links that you guys were talking about, about Heavens Above and the uh, Star Streaker, just added those to the YouTube chat. So to everyone in our YouTube audience, thank you so much for participating and watching. Um, we see the numbers of you who are live here, whether you actually uh, put something in the chat or not, we appreciate you joining us very much and look forward to seeing you all again next week, same time, same uh, NORLAB Astro channel. <laughs> Back to you, Bob. Thank you for joining us, Connie. Thank, well, thank you. you for your presentation and thank you for being our moderator today, Jamika. And I My think this is, we'll, we'll say see you next next see you next week. Bye thank everyone. You.